Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Amanda Neshuat and I work for the Town of Secaucus as their new environmental coordinator. I'll talk a little bit about what I do for my job a little later on in my presentation. But today I'm mostly talking about youth entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is something that I've been really interested in for the past four years. Um, I've done a lot of research and have really tried to um, adapt some of the entrepreneurial skills into my career currently so that I can one day actually be a full-fledged entrepreneur. But um, I'm hoping that you guys will really um, be inspired by this presentation and perhaps maybe even some of the things in here will resonate with one of you. Um, and if you have any questions, just please raise your hand during the presentation, it's fine. So why youth entrepreneurship? I'm pretty sure that um, everyone here is considered a millennial. I'm not sure, maybe not everyone, but um, anyone that's born after 1984, raise your hand. So you guys are millennials. Um, so they're calling the millennial generation the entrepreneurial generation. And there's a few reasons why. And here are some of the reasons why we've, um, some scientists and social sciences, scientists have actually gathered. First, um, unemployment rates are pretty darn low worldwide, not just in the United States. And um, a lot of the reason is because of, um, not only because of downsizing of companies and because of our recession in our economy, but also because we've been outsourcing a lot of jobs. So we're seeing a very large um, un unemployment rate. Um, independence, millennials really like to be independent. Almost 70% of millennials say that they would be an entrepreneur because of the freedom. They get the ability to choose the projects they want to do. They have control over their own work and they have unlimited income potential. I'm going to give you very specific examples of extremely successful entrepreneurs in the United States that maybe you've heard about. Um, but they actually did it because um, they had a specific skill set and were able to fill a certain space within their community or within um, their country or their business or corporation, whatever it is you want to be an entrepreneur, um, and knew that they were going to have unlimited income potential. So if you want to get to that point in your life, an entrepreneur would be a great uh, career for you. And opportunities for innovation. Because of the needs and the, the um, needs of the planet and of the people, um, we have lots of different solutions out there and young people are finding innovative ways um, to implement some of these solutions in, in businesses and, and worldwide or, or in their communities that they, they live in. But why sustainability? Well, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about climate change and water issues and uh, pollution and, and all those kinds of things. And, and sustainability, we're actually one of the first generations to actually see some of the effects of past generations and how um, you know faulty we've been in the way that we've been living, um, and the pollution levels and uh, climate issues and stuff like this, we're actually seeing it firsthand. So we are actually seeing a lot of legislation headed towards sustainability. What I mean by that, there's actually a lot of legislation to increase solar power, to implement more. Um, uh, to, to, to figure out ways to get organic farmers um, to have more success in their, in their farm, on their farm, um, figuring out ways to um, help small businesses and, and um, introduce more you know, in, in sustainability initiatives within, um, within communities. So I think a lot of legislation is now headed towards sustainability. Um, obviously, like before I said, the needs of the people on the planet, young people are looking for really cool, innovative ways to um, implement solutions that we need. Um, and millennials are considered very conscious consumers, um, guided by social, environmental, and ethical values. So 50% of us say that we try to buy products that support causes or charities. A lot of us say that we don't want to buy from a brand that doesn't contribute to a social and environmental cause. Um, that's why we're seeing the rise of many different companies, such as Tom's, um, where that gives to a social cause and, and uh, different kinds of uh, clothing companies that um, contribute to the uh, local areas where the clothing, or clothing is actually made. Um, and 57% of us actually say that we would rather buy more based on quality than on price. And so this just alone is actually completely changing the way that our market is working currently. Um, millennials just so happen to be the economy's largest consumer generation. Uh, currently, we're actually the largest, more, we're actually larger than the baby boomers at the moment. And um, we're seeing a lot of really cool different things happening within, our, and within the United States because of this. So how many of you guys have watched the latest like McDonald's commercials or Taco Bell or Coca-Cola commercials? Yeah, I don't have TV, but I watch Walking Dead. So um, I do watch the commercials in between. 
And when we were kids, when I was, you know, I'm 26 years old, so in the 90s, McDonald's was more about um, marketing towards little children, right? Some aspects of the commercial were cartoon, there was characters, there was always toys and the Happy Meal and all this kind of stuff. But now, if you notice, McDonald's actually has commercials that are very tar targeted towards millennials, people our age. And the real reason is why. The real reason why is because in the 90s, baby boomers were um, having kids that are, were about our age when we were in the 90s, whatever age you are now. Um, and now millennials are watching more television than younger people are, than children are, because they're more involved in the phones and in the tablets and in the computers and stuff like that. So that's why um, a lot of corporations and businesses are actually trying to figure out ways to not only get millennials to buy their products, because again we buy. More, uh, more based on quality than on price, but also to work for them. A lot of millennials, 36% of us say that we do not want to work for a corporation or a business that violates human rights or damages the environment. Um, and I think that resonates with a lot of people that are my age that are looking for jobs that are very fulfilling. So the Bloomberg report actually came out a couple of years ago with an article on um, how, to, how corporations are actually asking for consultants to help them get young people like us working for them. And so now you're seeing um, a lot of different, you know, big name brands that basically built America, like, um, like Coca-Cola, for instance. Um, they are uh, not only switching their products to, to kind of um, cater to millennials, so they have plant bottles and they have more like uh, environmentally and social conscious um, element to their commercials and to their advertising, um, but they're also changing the way their workspaces are to mimic Facebook and Google, which is kind of the companies that we really like, would like to work with, because it's more of a social um, atmosphere in the office space. So there's a lot of cool things happening with that. Also, we are way more interested in spending our money on experiences than on material goods. So how in the world are these name brands trying to figure out how to get people like us, our age, buying their products. And so that's what they're doing. They're, they're trying to update their, their image. They're trying to figure out ways of advertising to get us to buy their products. Um, but the UN actually just came out with a statement that said that millennials are spending tons more money than any generation before on travel. Apparently, um, we spent over $180 billion last year on annual tourism revenue. Um, and not only that, we're not looking for specific places around the world that are very luxe and very touristy. We're looking for, pl for places based on price convenience and also on accommodation. We want to be able to access the locals. So it's really interesting because we're totally changing that market as well. Um, and also, young people are voting for more progressive leaders. Unfortunately, young people um, are not voting enough. About 20% of millennials actually do vote. Um, but when we do vote, we're voting for more democratic, more progressive leaders, and that is also going to create a really cool sustainability market for us to be um, entering. Um, obviously, progressive leaders care about climate change, they care about social issues, um, and those are the kind of things that we need to foster you know, a good environment for entrepreneurial activity. So there's a lot, a lot of opportunities for sustainable development, a lot of opportunities to actually create businesses and jobs, um, services or products for, um, for many of these um, uh, different types of elements in our society. So we have water issues, climate issues, uh, transportation issues. We're seeing lots of really cool stuff happening with transportation here in New Jersey even. Um, uh, production of goods, um, that's, a, that's a big one. Disaster relief, obviously because of climate change, we're going to have to make more resilient communities and we're seeing a lot of cool organizations and businesses popping up where consultants can come into communities and, and help them to be more resilient for water issues and droughts. Um, and also women's empowerment. Um, this is a really big one because um, I have a lot of friends that work in this field as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because I'm, um, I'm also involved with the UN, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so in order for us to actually create global sustainability, we're going to have to lift families out of poverty. Um, one of the things we have to do is lift families out of poverty. And the way that we do that is by educating women. And so there's a really cool um, initiative right now at the UN and worldwide to get women to actually ac easily access primary and secondary education. And I have a friend that has been in the UN system now for 30 years. Um, she's actually the creator of a TV show called Captain Planet, which aired in the 90s. Does anyone know Captain Planet? Yeah, OK, cool. Um, <laughs> so she actually created a TV show that's based on Bio 101 for, for kids. That basically, at that age, they're about 8 to 12 years old. And um, 
I asked her what she thought was the one thing that we can do um, to actually promote global sustainability, to achieve global sustainability. And she said that the one thing we need to do is to be educating and, and empowering women. So that's a huge, huge thing that needs a lot of help and a lot of entrepreneurs are, are getting involved in that. So Secretary Gen General Ban Ki-moon um, is very, very, very devoted to youth worldwide and is very interested in youth entrepreneurship and youth-led businesses. And he said, I call on all partners to support youth entrepreneurship, self-employment, and youth-led businesses. The United Nations system will do its part. Our Global Compact Initiative will continue mobilizing and supporting young entrepreneurs and advancing a more sustainable future. I wasn't actually there at that conference, but someone actually that I know was there, so that's pretty cool. Um, but the UN global leaders are actually looking for ways to fund youth entrepreneurship. It's actually one of the things we talk about at conferences like on women's, uh, women's issues and climate change and sustainable development. This is a very, very big topic that they're talking about because it looks like young people, whether it be in small villages or in communities or in huge cities, are looking for really cool innovative ways um, to solve the world's biggest problems. And we want to be able to fund that. A little bit about some global trends on youth employment. So 73 million young people will be unemployed. Um, and that means that half a billion people between the years 2016 and 2030 will be looking for jobs. And the UN does think that entrepreneurship will be a really cool way of, um, of a really cool solution to this. Um, and I'm going to give a couple ex of examples. Most of the examples I'm giving are domestic in the United States, but I'm going to give one example of, of a, a young woman who was able to uh, implement sustainable um, initiatives in her community in Kenya in a bit. Um, this is just a chart. I just want to show you this because it's actually a, a really cool chart because it, it shows that people between the ages of 18 and 34 actually see um, and consider entrepreneurship to be a good career choice over half, over half of us worldwide, no matter what continent we're on. So um, the cool thing is that if you were to swap this out for another career, it would be all over the place. Um, so I do think that entrepreneurship is going to be you know, really, um, really taking off um, in the future, as it is now, actually. So I told you I was going to introduce you to Lorna. She actually started this business called EcoPost um, in the Rift Valley in Kenya. And in her 20s, she actually got help from the labor organization to shape, some, uh, to shape a business plan to try and get um, a lot of the waste um, and protect the forest around here, but also get a lot of the waste to be recycled. They weren't recycling at the time. Um, and by the time she was 24 years old, she was actually able to um, create a business that actually created 500 jobs. So what we're seeing in her community is that not only are people now having better livelihood, but they're actually a more sustainable community and actually an example to the rest of Kenya. Um, and um, she actually was at the UN. I wasn't able to see her, but um, she's like giving talks all the time about how you can be an entrepreneur in, in such a small you know, village um, in Kenya. And she was also able to save uh, over 1 million kilos of waste from the environment and save more than 250 hectares of forest. So super, super impactful. So a little bit about what I do, not to get more uh, domestic and to give a plug for the town of Secaucus. Um, I am the environmental coordinator for the town, and we are a silver certified community. What that means is that we have the highest level of sustainable certification um, with Sustainable Jersey, and there's only one of 27, we're one of 27 towns in the state that actually have this. Um, we have a lot of different initiatives, including building community gardens. We're making, we actually have five right now. One of our community gardens was actually in the record recently um, for being such a really cool, large uh, community garden. It has 54 raised beds. And I actually launched the application three weeks ago, and two weeks after that, um, they were all uh, used up. So people really love these gardens. Um, we have solar panels on most of our municipal buildings, including our town hall. Um, one, of our high uh, one of our schools, uh, our high school and middle school, and um, the DPW garage. And so I think there's another one, but we're, we're looking for ways to partner with other communities nearby to actually get more solar projects. We do try to incorporate sustainability in the, cr in the school curriculum, and we're looking for ways to get um, to be an eco-school school district. Um, this is kind of like Sustainable Jersey, where we do enough projects to get recognition from the state and be considered an eco-school. 
Um, we do have a very rig rigorous recycling program. We're actually the highest, we have the highest recycling rate in Hudson County. We save millions of dollars a year by recycling. We take it very, very seriously. We recycle many different types of things like e-waste, batteries, oil, and the traditional you know, um, aluminum and, and plastic and, and cans and stuff like that. Protection of natural resources. We're very, very serious about um, protecting our open space. You will never see new development in Secaucus. You'll only see redevelopment. We are working on energy audits to reduce our carbon footprint. We're trying to get, um, we're trying to educate people about how to conserve energy within their own homes. Um, I also, uh, I also advise the mayor and council as well as residents and businesses um, throughout the community about environmental issues and what they can do. Um, and something new that we have is we're actually, we actually got four new smart cars. These smart cars are fully electric and they're actually charged by the solar grid, so it's completely fossil free fossil free cars. I actually brought one with me today, but I had to, um, I had to park in a regular spot. I couldn't show it to you guys up front. Um, but we are really focusing right now on upgrading our fleet. We actually just realized that one police car in our town um, actually uses about five to eight hundred dollars a month worth of gasoline. So that's a huge carbon footprint that we're getting rid of as we're trying to upgrade to hybrid cars or newer cars or cars that are um, better on miles per gallon. So how did I get this job? It's probably what you're wondering. I'm one of seven environmental coordinators in the state, and I'm one of three in Hudson County. Um, so I actually was in college when I was doing a lot of work um, organizing campaigns with, um, high school, with college students on environmental issues on campus. And I was working so much in Bergen County that I decided, well, why don't I just do something in Hudson County, which is where I live? So for the first time ever, I walked down the block and entered my town hall. And I went and had a meeting with the mayor about volunteering for the town and, and doing some more projects for the community. And he said, oh, sure, Amanda. Well, we don't have anyone chairing our environmental committee right now. Um, so why don't you chair our environmental committee and, and organize a green festival so that you know, people can be more aware of environmental issues. And at the time, I was organizing fest, I mean, uh, uh, conferences. And so I figured it would be something that I could do. It kind of was a perfect fit for me. So over the summer, I worked uh, for the town part time to work on this festival. And I at the same time, with the environmental committee, I started several different projects. So that when I left, they actually had to call me back. When I went back to school, I mean, they actually had to call me back and say, Amanda, is it OK if you can actually finish these projects and work part time while you're in college? So as you can imagine, that's pretty much a dream for me because I get to work with the community um, and, and implement sustainability, uh, sustainable solutions. So um, after I graduated, I showed the town how much money we had been saving, which was in the millions. We actually brought in about $200,000 worth of grants from the projects that I had completed. We got um, you know, state and national recognition for some of the projects that we had done for our styrofoam ban. Uh, we did it before New York City did, actually, two years before. Um, and because of that, they actually decided, well, you know, we need her, and we need this in this town. And so they hired me. They actually, actually wrote the job description with them, um, and they hired me as the town's first environmental coordinator. Um, and it's cool to say that, you know, I'm one, I'm one of seven, but that's actually not that cool, because there's 500-something municipalities in New Jersey. And I'm sure if you guys are interested in that, that you can perhaps do that and be a trailblazer in your community as well. So what I do at the UN is that I take my local knowledge, my grassroots local community knowledge, and put it on an international platform at the United Nations. Um, so four years ago, when I actually first started working part-time for the Town of Sea Caucus, I decided that I wanted to do, I wanted to actually understand a little bit more about global issues. And instead of enrolling in a global or an international affairs course, I applied to be a UN representative at the UN. And, um, I actually was interviewed and got in, which was really cool. But, but mostly my role would be to um, represent the foundation, which is called the Foundation for Post-Conflict Development. Um, but I took a little, a little bit further because I was an activist at the time, and I was, well, I still am an activist, but I'm an activist and I have a little bit of local knowledge and I, I do consider myself to be someone who could represent young people in America. And um, was able to wedge my way into these conferences as actually the youth's voice. On, on sustainability issues and on women's issues. And so here I am um, to the left speaking at the UN about my youth experience as an, a UN youth representative, which I was at the time. And um, I was, uh, 
it was a really interesting um, conference and, and actually experience for me because it was basically a bunch of young people in the room trying to figure out um, you know how how to how to be the youth voice, but you you know everyone there was already the youth voice. So it was a, it was a, it was a fun panel though. So young people that I meet from all around the world that are entrepreneurs or that are, are people trailblazing in their communities are working mostly on these issues which you may be interested in. Waste management, um, water and sanitation, obviously, renewable energy, um, agriculture is a really, really big one. Um, actually, there's a lot of help right now from, um, um, from the UN if you are interested in, in, in starting an organic farm in some countries in the world. And it could also be, sustainability can also be included in so many careers, whatever it is that you're interested in, add the element of sustainability in there. That means that if you are a business um, or a fashion um, business or um, whether you're interested in teaching or um, in marketing or arts or technology, whatever it is, adding that extra element of sustainability in your community and having that triple bottom line that, that, that benefits the, you know, uh, the people and the environments and the economy will also get other innovative companies to want to work with you. And we're, and we're seeing that a lot, actually. Companies that are very, very um, you know, socially conscious are working with other companies and organizations that are also socially conscious. So, so you know, it's important to be a part of that. So I'm going to talk now about some entrepreneurs that you may or may not have heard about that are about our age. I chose them based on diversity of gender, of educational background, whether or not they went to college or didn't go to college or are in college now, um, uh, interests, and um, uh, uh, yeah, interests. Okay. So this is Sean. He started Humdinger Wind Energy. He's 28 years old. And what he did is that he created this small device that can capture energy on uh, places where wind turbines won't fit, like bridges and skyscrapers and, and other types of urban areas. So he saw that um, you know, the future may need more types of um, uh, alternative energy um, in areas where that can't be reached by huge wind turbines or solar panels, and, and he decided to create that. He actually did get um, some funding from private investors. You'll find that a lot of these entrepreneurs had angel investors or actually had help from the government, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, you don't have to come from a privileged family to be an entrepreneur is what I'm saying. You can find ways to fund your projects. Nick, Rob, and Emily, uh, they started a, a website called Foodsy. Um, and they're about 25 years old. And what they saw was that people that were uh, making baked goods and artisanal um, uh, food were, um, had a, didn't have a bridge to people that actually wanted um, these kinds of things. So they actually made a website. They provide an online market for artisanal and organ organic food producers who peddle baked goods, cheeses, and other products to customers across the country. So again, they found that there was a need for that, and they filled that space. And um, the first two years that Foodsy was online, that actually made about $3 million. I think now it's worth $8 million. Love this story. This is Tyler. He's 24 years old. And what he does is he builds hiking trails in national parks. So he was a park ranger in a national park out west somewhere, I forget where. But he noticed that some of the trails were pretty beaten up, and they were not really suitable for people to walk on safely. He also noticed that the federal government had a large pool of money that was specifically for the preservation and maintenance of national parks. So what he did was he started this company with uh, five other friends of his called On the Beaten Path Trail Contractors. And the first three years that he was um, Live, so to say, he actually was able to have about to, to garnish about um, to gather about eight million dollars worth of contracts from the government, and I think I think now it's double that. So super super interesting story because if you read some of his interviews, he's kind of just like, well, I don't really know what happened. I just decided I wanted to do this, and they gave me money for it. <laughs> so uh, basically, you don't have to compromise your salary or your you know your paycheck to to do something really cool and to do what you love. Because essentially, he just wants to be in national parks all day long. <laughs> um, here's Rebecca Hugh. I'm, I'm not sure if many people have heard about her. Um, her name is, uh, she started a company called Eva Tran. And she's 27 years old. 
wasn't really sure what she wanted to do, but she was really interested in the fact that her father was an electrical engineer and kind of le leveraged his expertise with electrical transformers to create plug-less power. It's a system that wirelessly changes your electrical vehicle, kind of like the charging pad does to your iPad. Um, and she's looking to actually put this in parking lots and in roads and in driveways and in garages so that people can you know, have really easy access to uh, charge, wirelessly charge their electrical vehicles. And what's really cool is that she actually didn't go to school for that either. She, was, um, she, really didn't, she wasn't really sure what she wanted to do until this happened and now she's CEO of a company and, and um, actually the company is worth a few million now. But she actually was able to get $2.5 million from private investors who were interested in what she was doing. And also she got $4 million for the Department of Energy because at that time they actually had, and they still do have, a lot of money to fund um, different ideas for electrical vehicles and also for trying to get more um, charge and batteries. So they have millions of dollars, a uh, pool of millions of dollars worth um, to do something like that, so to give to, to young people or to people that are willing to you know, uh, invest in that. Okay, so Charles, he is the CEO of Greening Forward. He's 24 years old. Um, and so this is a different type of company, but what he's doing is basically giving opportunities to young people. Um, so he seeks to mobilize other youth to get involved in green initiatives globally. And I like what he said, it's not about empowering young people. Young people already have the power. It's about giving young people the opportunities to show that power. So everyone here pretty much has the power. But, you know, we're working on ways to give you more opportunities to show that power. And perhaps maybe, you know, you can look into Greening Forward and, and uh, get some help from Charles. Love this story. Emily and Jessica, they're 29 years old. They were having a party at their apartment. And they were pretty mad that pretty much everything that they, um, uh, pretty much all the party goods that they had to get were plastic or were paper with, ra with wax on it, which is not recycled. And so they had a conversation with each other about like, well, why don't companies actually make sustainably sourced party goods? Um, and so they said, well, why don't we just make one? So a couple of years after their um, uh, line was launched, their website um, was worth, I think, three or four million dollars. And now the company is worth $9 million. So, and, that, and by the way, all these entrepreneurs that you see have um, you know, basically started within the past five years. So they're just starting out. And I'd say it's a pretty good start. <laughs> Efron, he's 17 years old. He's the CEO of City Capital. And he basically started this um, energy initiative, which focuses on producing alternative energy specializing in biofuels. And the cool thing is that he is actually the youngest African-American CEO of any publicly, publicly traded company ever. And you'll see that a lot of millennials are actually um, you know, breaking down walls and, and, and breaking records. So this is, a, this is a really cool example. And I want to talk a little bit about female entrepreneurship because right now, not only is it a very good time for entrepreneurs because there hasn't been so many opportunities in our society ever in American history to start a business than right now. Um, but also, uh, a lot more angel investors and private investors are actually investing more in female-led companies more than ever before. So right now, women own 10.6 million businesses in the United States. We employ 20 million workers. That's one in every seven employees. Um, and we account for about 2.5 trillion in sales. I say we because I consider myself an entrepreneur in some way. Um, so uh, nearly 20% of investors in 2012 invested in women-led businesses, and the percentage actually grew more than 40% than the previous year. So it's rapidly growing. Um, you know, but there is room for improvement, although there is room for improvement. Um, the U.S. is actually ranked number one among 17 countries in having the conditions that foster high potential female entrepreneurship. So the United States is a pretty good place to start. So I just put together some of the things that um, very successful entrepreneurs that we hear about all the time uh, talk about and have experienced and uh, some of their personality traits. Maybe you might, um, uh, maybe you can resonate with some of these. Um, hates the status quo, easily bored, ready to improve everything, fired from jobs, uh, bad at making small talk, bullied in your youth, um, don't fit the norm. A lot of entrepreneurs are very, very uninterested in conforming and fitting the norm. So maybe that's something that, you're, that you feel is um, similar to you. 
So steps on the entrepreneurial path. Some things that you really need to do in order to be a really successful entrepreneur. And, and this actually comes from a, a really good book that I've read. I have it down at the bottom. It's called Life Entrepreneurs, Ordinary People Creating Extraordinary Lives. Um, some of the things that really successful entrepreneurs that we've heard about, like um, Cory Booker or the guy that made Cliff Bars, one of the examples I read, um, very, very interesting how he was just basically riding a mountain bike and had an idea to make a, to make a, 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 power, bar, a power bar, and now it's like one of the most successful power bars ever. Um, but um, he said, uh, discovering your core identity is very, very important. Really understanding who you are, what you love to do, and what you're good at, and taking the time to understand what that means. In fact, that's probably the number one contribution that young people or anyone can actually give to the people, to, to people and to the planet. Awakening to opportunity, understanding that there is opportunity all around you, recognizing where your resources are, and by resources I mean not only people but also the location that you're in. Envisioning the future, a lot of these entrepreneurs saw that later in the future there was going to be a need for some of the stuff that they were doing, that they're currently working on now. Um, I just told you that um, a lot of legislation is headed towards sustainability, and in that way we can envision the future and think, okay, well what can we do to, to fit into that? Um, developing goals and strategies is a very important thing, which I actually just got on the ball on now. Um, it's a very important thing to do for young people, especially, just to figure out what are some of the goals that you have. They don't have to be definite goals, but you know, what are some of the goals that you want to have? Um, building healthy support systems, and this goes for anything. You know, it's really important to be able to surround yourself with people that encourage you and that support you. Um, taking action and making a difference. A lot of times when we you know, take part in our communities and have that experience of making a difference, we can figure out from that experience what it is we really want to do and how we want to do it. So it's a really cool way of, um, of, of figuring out what it, is you'd like, how, and what it is you'd like to do to contribute. And embracing renewal and reinvention. This is basically you know, um, being adaptable. So this is a perfect example is our government system, right? Uh, pretty much everyone realizes that climate change is affecting us, but we still have uh, people within our government that are saying, you know, oh, climate change isn't real and it's not happening, and stopping any kind of legislation that's happening um, uh, that's going to be, you know, um, you know, fighting or combating climate change. So you can see that our government is not very good at adapting to certain generations and also reinventing itself. Um, so you don't want to be that way. And just to close, um, this is a quote from Angel Cabrera uh, from the World Economic Forum Council on Entrepreneurship. And she said, only by letting millions of entrepreneurs try new ideas to innovate, to create businesses that put those ideas to work in a competitive and open way, only by doing those things are we going to be able to tackle the world's biggest problems. And I, ask, I, I do believe that. All right, thank you. Any questions or comments? In the beginning, you mentioned um, empowering women through education and how it's related to sustainability. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What's the connection between educating women and making a more sustainable life? Okay, so the role of women in families all around the world is very important. Um, we find that when we educate women, like for instance, if we, if we were to actually educate only 20% of the women that are not in primary or secondary education in India, that the, its GDP will actually grow by 40%. Um, and so the role of women in their families and communities are very, is very important. If you actually educate women in, in most places around the world, if you educate women in their families, there's, their children will also be, have an education as well. And, and again, this is, going to be, um, this is going to give us an opportunity to um, not only give women jobs, but they actually start their own jobs where they get to contribute to their community and contribute to their family. Um, and it's pretty, much the, uh, it's pretty much saying that there's one group of people around the world that we are not investing a lot of time and money in, and if we did, we'd actually be able to balance um, what it is that we need in the world to actually promote um, sustainability and equality. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Yes. What, what's your optimal like target range for women to like start influencing them to like get involved? What do you mean? Like, like what, 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 like what age group do you target first to get them involved? Like okay. high school, middle school, like what, what would be your target first? Well, it depends for certain, um, 
It depends for certain types of issues. Like, for instance, if you want to um, target women to uh, you know, um, make sure that they have an education, um, usually between the ages of 10 and 12 uh, around the world is what we're seeing, these um, campaigns to try and reach out to 10 to 12-year-old young women to make sure that they're in school and what they need and all that kind of stuff. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Like what, what would help you like change the perception that they have of society now to be more environmental? Like what's your goal towards that? Well, in general, um, women around, the, so, so I also do stuff as an activist at the UN. And in general, around the world, uh, women are at the forefront of the environmental movement. And so to be able to give them um, what they need, support and resources that they need at the front lines of this movement. So, so for instance, a uh, perfect example, there are women um, in um, places in Africa, many different places in Africa, where they actually have to walk an hour and a half, two hours a day to get water. Now, when climate change affects them, which it already is, it already is affecting many places around the world, um, it's going to create more droughts. And so they're going to need to walk a little further. And so those are the women that are affected and those are the women that we need to reach out to and give support and resources to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes. What are the current, current cities that have environmental coordinators? Um, Montclair and Newark that I know of. I don't know of the other five. So I'm not sure what town, what town do you live in? Hackensack. Hackensack? Okay. Well, they need one. So if you if you're interested, and and the really cool thing is that seriously, um, I bring in f you know f a lot more money than they're paying me. You see what I mean? It's nothing. What they're paying me is nothing compared to the almost you know quarter of a million dollars that I bring in worth of grants. You see what I'm saying? There's actually a lot of grants out right right now out there from the federal and the state government to try and help communities that want to be um, more sustainable. So if Right now is a really huge opportunity for that to happen. And in fact, I actually just talked to someone. Um, he's, um, he's about our age, and he is a media relations guy in Verona. And he just started um, with the Sustainable Jersey program. Uh, it's basically a program to get communities to become more sustainable. And um, right now, they actually are um, paying him extra money to do this. And eventually, he wants to kind of just like wedge his way into that type of career because he loves it so much. So there's certain ways of doing that. I have friends also that work for, for businesses, uh, corporations. Um, my one friend that works for um, an architecture firm, she's very, very interested in green design, but she works for a firm that's really old fashioned. Um, and she brought her ideas about working in a way that can use, um, you know, that could be more, where buildings can be more efficient and green. Um, and they're actually starting to listen to her now, and she actually may be someone in the, within the company pretty soon that is going to be able to help the, 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 the business um, grow in that way. So there's so many different ways that you can be a trailblazer. And you know, really, I use the term entrepreneur in this uh, presentation as someone who was willing to take risks and think outside the box, um, and willing to really um, you know, put that creativity out there. You know, I know a lot of us are pretty, sometimes we're afraid to show our individuality and stuff like that. So, you know, be as creative as you possibly can be. And when you start thinking that way, a lot of ideals will come to you. Sorry, I got off track with that question, but yeah. Yeah, I just want to know, like, with the, uh, what do you think is the best way to, like, if you had, like, an idea or a cause to, like, get out there and, like, let people know about it? You think, like, contacting the federal uh, the government is like, the only way to, like, get revenue to, like, Make your idea better, or you could you do like an independent company or something like that? Or? Well, we're seeing really cool um, funding platforms on the internet. So my friend just started a company called Simple Co, and she was on Indiegogo. Is that what it's called? Indiegogo, I think it's called. Um, and uh, she basically wanted ten thousand dollars to start this company to make products that don't have packaging and are sustainably sourced, because um, she was pretty fed up about you know how toothpaste and how you know, detergent and all kind of stuff comes in plastic. And she started this company, $10,000. It actually went up to $40,000. She was last week on Fox News talking about her business. She's been trans, her, all her articles and videos have been translated in like several different languages around the world. And now her business is like worth $100,000. And it's only been like literally six months since she started. So it's a, that's a really, really cool example of a way that she was able to do that. Yeah. You don't have to just ask, you know, don't wait for the people at the top. You don't have to do that. <laughs>
just saying, if there's, if there's funding for that anywhere, really, then you, know, you can figure out a way to do that. OK, cool. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be around. <laughs>